Um, your road to uh, Wall Street uh, begins in Quincy, Illinois, where you grew up. What in your early years brought you to uh, uh, the world of journalism? What fascinated you about newspapering? Well, my first job, I guess you could call it my first job if you don't count lawn mowing, um, was at the local newspaper in Quincy. And uh, that was my first taste of, of journalism. And I guess it was only later that I realized, I mean, I thought of it sort of as a hobby. I mean, the pay was, was quite low, although I was happy to get it. Um, so I wasn't thinking of it so much as a money-making activity, but as something that was educational and I would learn something, but also turned out to be so much fun. And growing up, I had never really thought that, well, a job would be fun. You know, I thought that was reserved for when you finished work or something. And only later did I realize, well, people, and of course I saw it there, but uh, it dawned on me that, yes, you can actually make a living doing this, and it's still fun. Um, I guess I've always liked stories. I've always liked uh, to read. I guess my earliest memories, really, in, in Quincy were reading books, going to the beautiful old public library at 4th and Main Street, which is a sort of a child's fantasy of what a library should look like. Um, it's now a museum, but uh, at the time that was the, the main library, and I spent hours in there. I read everything I could get my hands on, and I think a love of re out of a love of reading naturally evolves um, eventually a love of writing. What kind of encouragement did your parents give you? Oh, they were extremely encouraging. Um, I always had books. I mean, they took me to the library. They, my mother read to me a great deal. Um, I mean, books were a part of my life from the earliest moment I have any, any consciousness of it. Although I do remember they, they tried to impose a time limit on my reading. There was a, a lights out policy, which I thought I had cleverly circumvented by getting a flashlight with a magnetic attachment, which I could keep hooked to the bed frame. So the lights would go out, the door would be closed, and I would get the flashlight out and continue reading by flashlight. Except one, I remember this quite vividly, I was remember reading a book called um, Blitz the Wonder Horse. And I think Blitz's mother, a, a horse obviously, was sold to some horrible glue manufacturer or something like that. But anyway, it was a, it was a tear jerking scene and I, I started sobbing uncontrollably. My parents came rushing in to see what the matter was and there I was in, in flagrante with the flashlight. So <laughs> they weren't too severe in their punishment. But. Oh, that's wonderful. What sort of stories did you cover for the for the Quincy newspaper when you were It's funny how huh? I remember those so many of those stories so clearly. I had an amazing breadth of of stories. The very first story I recall writing was about a tornado that struck a gas station in Edina, Missouri. And I guess I was barely old enough to have a driver's license, but I drove over there and, you know, like one wall was knocked down and interviewed people. But it was great just sort of being on the ground, going up to total strangers, asking them what happened. Um, I also covered many of the uh, baseball games for, for the Quincy Cubs. Or I didn't so much cover them as I, was take, I would take down the information by phone. The sports reporter would be at the stadium and he would phone in what happened. And then I had to actually write up the the story. Um, I remember covering the Miss Missouri pageant in Mexico, Missouri, listening to the talent competition and the Miss Adams County Fair. The, the Adams County Fair was always big and I did a lot of stories there. And I remember having to write down the names of all these prize winning hogs. And although, of course, you know, I grew up in Quincy, which is in a rural area, but we were, you know, city people. So I didn't really know all the, the hog breeds. And um, I remember this guy kept saying, you know, he'd won in the do he would say what well, I thought he was saying, the new rock hog category, I'd write down N-E-W-R-O-C-K. And it was only later I discovered that every time he, I thought he was saying new rock, he was actually saying do rock, that's D-U-R-O-C, which many people in this area will recognize as a very prominent breed of hog that I had never heard of it. Um, and I have to say, I committed the most egregious journalistic error of my entire career writing for the Quincy Herald Wig. Another one of my jobs was I would take the news from Hannibal, Missouri, from our correspondent down there, who I distinctly recall was named Mabel Daniels. And so she found in one day that Hannibal City Council had approved this major comprehensive plan of blood insurance. So I wrote this whole story, you know, homeowners could get so much coverage and small business people. and. Um, the next day the story ran, Hannibal City Council approves blood insurance, which was the headline. 
And as you may have guessed, the entire story, every time she, I thought she was saying blood, she was actually saying flood. I'm sure I said, do you mean flood, F-L-O-O-D? And she said, yes. I mean, blood, B-L-O-O-D. And she said, yes, that's right, flood, F-L-O-O-D. And somehow I kept writing down blood. But the funny thing was, we, of course, we had to run a correction, but um, quite a few people in Quincy phoned in to, to wonder why Quincy did not have a blood insurance program. <laughs> I think everyone has had a moment like that. No, yeah, and, and probably everyone in journalism. But I'm I'm grateful that you know the the Harold Wig was indulgent and um, I didn't lose my my job. It was uh, it was later, of course. You you uh, you ended up in you, went, you ended up. Let me rephrase it. Uh, it was not a direct path though into journalism. You ended up in law school, attending Harvard Law. Yeah, that's correct. As I said, I you know I thought journalism was something you did kind of as a hobby for fun, and that, it took quite a while before I gained the conviction that, yes, you could make a living at it. I, and I went to college, and I worked on the college paper, and um, I guess I thought, well, you know, going to, being a lawyer would be a real job or something. But I have to say that even by the time I graduated from law school, I still thought there was a distinct possibility that I would, would perhaps practice briefly and then go into journalism, which is what ended up happening. Where did you go between, uh, between law school and, and the Wall Street Journal when you finally came Well, out? it was a very valuable experience. I worked at a large law firm in New York City. Um, the name is Cravath, Swain & Moore. It has a lot of large corporate clients. And uh, one of my first clients was Kellogg back in the Midwest. I was traveling here a lot. I worked, did libel-related work and media work. Uh, CBS at the time was a large client there. And that was I, I was there almost three years, and that was a very valuable glimpse into the way the business world really worked, which of course is very different from you would, what you would think from the outside. It was amazing, you know, like postgraduate education, having those clients hearing, you know, from the inside what was going on in big companies. So when I then did leave there and become a journalist, I think it was, I had a great advantage that I knew the kinds of questions to ask because I had some pretty good insights to what really went on in boardrooms and uh, in the executive suite in, at major corporations. To the outsider, it must be rather monolithic and intimidating. You wouldn't know where to go or where to ask the questions or what questions to ask. Yeah, I think that's correct. And one thing I've learned over the years as a journalist that um, many of the best questions are a result of sort of educated guesswork. You put the known pieces together and you maybe are speculating a little bit about what happened, but when you then ask the question, the subject of the question like thinks, oh my God, he knows so much, or he's right, or they tend to leap to the conclusion that you know more than you actually do, and then end up, I think, sharing uh, information. Uh, one thing I've learned is that the more, the more you know, the more you can learn. And you've also been very good at cultivating sources inside, the, inside Wall Street. I guess so. I, you know, I, I teach a course in journalism, and my students are always asking, well, how do you get people to talk? You know, that's the, the magic in, in journalism. And I, I don't have any simple answer to that. I mean, I obviously, yes, I do cultivate people, but I don't, I don't consciously think of, cult, of it as cultivation at the time. I think maybe that's part of it. I think it's mostly just a genuine interest in, in what people are doing and a willingness to listen. I find... Uh, it's amazing in our culture today how many people talk and, and how few people listen. That you, you hear these, you see these talk shows on television where people are screaming at each other, and no one ever listens. I've been on some of these shows, and I, they ask a question, and I answer, and I can tell they're not, they don't care what I say. They absolutely um, don't listen at all. And when you actually listen to someone, it's a very powerful thing. I think it's a, it's inherently flattering and encouraging, and. Um, People like that, not always, but that encourages them to maybe open up more. Give a little bit more of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, describe the Wall Street uh, as you describe Wall Street as you saw it when you came to the the paper in 1983. Uh, so much was going on, and so much was about to happen. It was one of those, you know, fortuitous being at the right place at the right time kinds of things. Um, it, it, just before I got there. Um, 19, the economy had been, you know, sort of underperforming and Wall Street had been not doing nothing really for like almost a decade. And in 82, suddenly the stock market started picking up and then the sort of Reagan years unfolded and it was just a huge, um, exciting uh, time on Wall Street when, you know, fortunes were being made 
left and right, and lifestyles were being turned upside down, and the whole culture in some ways of America was shifting. Um, it, it wasn't just America too, it was Margaret Thatcher in Britain, there was this whole, I mean Ivan Boesky of course took it to the ultimate extreme when he said that greed is good, but there was that kind of notion you know, permeating the canyons of Wall Street. It was like people could come from nowhere and become billionaires. Uh, the old guard was being shaken and, and, and cast aside. So it was a, a period of great dynamism, of great fortunes being made. And as it turned out, not surprisingly, I guess, it was also a time of uh, great corruption and, and people taking advantage of this. How were the Ivan Boskys and Michael Milkins different from the people who had ruled and had, had led Wall Street in previous years? Well, they were outsiders. Um, they were not from the uh, traditional establishment in America. And, and by the way, I think there have been previous eras on Wall Street. I mean, Wall Street has always attracted a certain number of outsiders, but at the same time, the, the sort of image of Wall Street, the major institutions of Wall Street, had traditionally been controlled by products, you know, people who grew up in the Eastern establishment, who attended the Ivy League schools, who belonged to the same clubs. Um, who knew each other, there was a common culture. It was, you know, essentially it was white Christian males and uh, with the right school ties and connections. And um, that changed radically in those years. Uh, Ivan Bosky grew up in, in Detroit. Michael Milken grew up uh, outside of Los Angeles. And they came out of nowhere and suddenly they were, you know, they were titans. They were, they were revered. I mean, one of the scenes in my book ended up writing about this was Ivan Bosky giving the commencement speech at the University of California at Berkeley where he had been voted by the students to give the speech. And you know, I graduated from high school in 1969. You know, Berkeley was the site of massive anti-war protests. And the idea that between 1969 and 1985 that there had been that much of a sea change, that the students of Berkeley had gone from being you know, hippie anti-war protesters to young capitalist arbitrageurs in the making was an astounding change. How did the whole thing come apart? Well, it's interesting to me because I've seen it in other contexts as well, but there's a, in that kind of environment where so much money is being made, so much power is being wielded and accumulated, egos are so big, um, a, a sort of hubris sets in. Um, I, it's like you can see a whole sort of world that it all makes sense to the people who are in the middle of it. But to everyone else, you can just see that whole world sort of like a big balloon begin to swell and rise up through the atmosphere, getting pulling ever more on its string from the kind of rest of society and its values. And sooner or later, the string snaps. In this particular case, it was it was someone named Dennis Levine who. Um, emulated the Milkins and Boskys, but was much less clever. He thought he was clever, and for a while he was quite successful, which of course reinforced his felonious impulses. And he was brazenly insider trading. He worked his way into a succession of, of investment banks on Wall Street, ending up at Drexel, Burnham, Lambert. And eventually, just his greediness and his blatant uh, violation of the rules meant that he was detected and uncovered. And um, he wasn't going to just take the fall, fall on his sword. He talked in order to get a favorable sentence. And he began implicating others who were also engaging in wall, wall, wrongdoing on Wall Street. And that, that was the thing that then the whole, the whole house of cards began to come down. Were, were other news media complicit in the, uh, in, in the situation by not looking a little further, not digging deeper at the time? Well, complicit suggests there's some kind of, you know, culpability okay. or complacent. Um, the, the news media is always, in many ways, I mean, we expect so much of the news media. Um, we expect it to sort of mirror society, but then we also expect it to sort of get behind it and, and, and tell us what's really going on. And I think, I guess you could say the media was mirroring what was going on there. There was this kind of, you know, media celebration of these people turning turning these people into sort of cultural heroes. Suddenly, you know, captains of industry and Wall Street entrepreneurs were, uh, their entire lives and biographers, biographies were being, you know, splashed across the tabloids and big pictures and glamorous parties and, you know, big things at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, you know, taking over boards of the major cultural institutions. I mean, it was fascinating to see all of that happening in the media reporting it and it being celebrated. Uh, and then, 
so, but yes, I think, you know, not everyone's an investigative reporter. Some, some of the media went along for the ride and enjoyed all the champagne and the, the crumbs spilling over from those tables as well, and then others did investigate it. Um, I, you know, I can help it look back more recently at, you know, the, the whole dot-com explosion and the, uh, the Internet and the telecom boom and the, the way, the, the, to some extent, the media also was, you know, just riding along with that. You know, instead of glorifying Michael Milton, now it was there glorifying Bill Gates or Larry Ellison or, um, you know, I think of Michael Lewis's book, The New New Thing. Everybody was snapping it up and there was this, like, heady, frothy excitement about it. And all that shows up in the media, I think, naturally. And we saw, to a certain extent, the same thing with, with Enron and its, its growth. And yeah, and Enron was part of the same phenomenon. This is suddenly, it was this new economy that was being, being celebrated. But then, you know, the media, you know, chameleon-like, can turn, you know, very fast and very viciously. Have the lessons, have the lessons though, of, of the 1980s been forgotten or, or, or overlooked somehow because of the explosive growth of, of the dot-coms and, and, and uh, entities like Enron? Well, I think whenever you see great fortunes being made, uh, selective memory begins to set in. Um, I, I think I said at the end of my book on the 80s that, um, that I thought the, the, the scandal and the, uh, the sentences that were meted out had been extremely important in restoring confidence in Wall Street. And as a result of that, I think there was, that set the stage for this tremendous bull market in the 90s. I mean, people were able to have confidence again that the stock market was not a rigged game. Uh, much good came out of that. But um, I think our attention span isn't as long as it once was. Our memories are not as long. We're flooded with new information. And, the, you know, the last comparable scandal had been in, in the late 20s, early 30s. And then it took, it took 50 years for a comparable scandal to resurface. So you had a scandal in the mid-'80s, and now we're having another scandal, you know, in the early 2000s. It only took 15 years for a very similar pattern to begin to, to take effect. So I would say, you know, it doesn't surprise me that all that human nature being what it is, that this would have returned in another guise. Uh, it maybe just returned a little faster than I would have expected. How did the Wall Street Journal's... Uh, what was the Wall Street Journal's role in trying to bring this to light? What sort of... Uh, editorial, um, if you will, direction were you given at the time this was all taking place back in the mid-80s? Well, I was given tremendous support as a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. In fact, I look back on it now and I, I, you know, I think it's somewhat amazing, but the, um, the managing editor at the time, Norman Perlstein, was just completely supportive. Um, I only found out later that, that at one story the libel lawyer had said to the chairman of Dow Jones that if I was wrong about this story, in other words, if we were subjected to a libel suit by Drexel and Michael Milken, that the potential liability would have bankrupted the Wall Street Journal. I mean, the, the, the amount of money at stake was so vast. Um, I never heard that while this reporting was going on. I only heard that story years later, which to me is about all you need to say. I mean, that took a tremendous amount of um, respect for the journalistic process and, of course, confidence in me that I never was told that. Um, I was simply told to, to find out the truth, follow it wherever it, it took me, and to be careful and accurate. Uh, and then I had, I had the full support. And I came under enormous challenge in all different ways from people adversely affected by this. And I, I think if a reporter did not have the staunch back, backing of an organization like that, you, you, would, you would wither. Um, it would be very, very difficult. Did you find your credibility being attacked? Pretty much constantly. Um, Can you describe in what ways? Well, um, there were any number of attempts to go directly to my superiors to have me fired uh, by people. There were some, you know, some outrageous allegations that are so ludicrous I'm not even going to repeat them, but I mean, I did get you know, asked about, I mean, everything from, you know, personal misconduct to, like, improper sources, um, and, of course, the usual thing, that it was wrong and it was reckless. Um, I will, it really f would have felt they would have done anything to get me taken off, off the story, but, you know, in the end, none of it had any effect. And, uh, and you, were, you were duly noted for that with the Pulitzer Prize. That's correct. And, you know, I, is this an Illinois quality? I don't know. I have a... I feel I'm a relatively mild-mannered person, but I have an immense amount of determination at times. I, hate, I don't want to use the word stubbornness, which I think has a kind of negative connotation, but 
they were, they so, I think, misinterpreted me personally, because the more of these kinds of attacks that I underwent, the more determined I became. And um, something might have deflected me off the story, but what, what I consider to be unfair, sort of below the belt, personal attacks on me with my bosses and superiors was never going to work. I cannot tell you how determined I became, uh, and which I kind of think of as a mid Midwestern quality. You became uh, the page one editor of the Wall Street Journal shortly thereafter. Uh, what sort of uh, take does the Wall Street Journal, uh, or direction does the Wall Street Journal take when uh, you're examining something, let's say, such as uh, what happened on your watch, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, something that not very many people can, can say with any uh, uh, real credulity that they actually saw coming. Right. Well, I had an, an unbelievable period in history to be the page one editor. I, I mean, I, it was it, Tiananmen Square in China happened, in, I think, in a matter of weeks within my taking over the job. And I felt it never let up until the day I left the, the position. I think that from 92 to 96 was a little calmer in a lot of ways, but that period, 88 through 92, was just an amazing, exciting period in history. And I should say, you know, the Wall Street Journal is known as, to have a conservative editorial voice, uh, but that's the editorial page, and the news staff is completely separate from that, and we, we quite consciously tried to have no uh, political ideology in our work. It was to simply find out the facts. Um, so, yes, it was a constant surprise, and, uh, and I remember we didn't have the people. I remember the Berlin Wall, for example. I, I just I grabbed one of my favorite reporters and said, you know, get on the next plane to Berlin. And I remember her expenses were rolling in. And I said, I don't, I don't care what the expenses are, just, you know, get the story. And um, because we didn't have someone in Berlin uh, when that happened. We had to mobilize people for the Gulf War, which came up very quickly. Um, suddenly, you know, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and it was a major crisis, and we had to mobilize people. And one of the exciting things about page one editor was helping figure out where do we put people, where do we put our resources, what mandate do we give the reporters, who do we assign to particular stories. Uh, but there was never a shortage of, of breaking news in that period. It was very exciting. No doubt about that. Uh, when, did, when did you step down from that position? Uh, after the 92 election, I stayed through the Clinton's first election, and um, I stepped down after that. And it was a very exciting job, um, but I, I think I really had to make the decision. Did I want to focus more on my own writing, or did I want to stay in news management and editing? And having done both at that point, and, and having done both at, at very exciting spots, I decided um, that I really wanted to pursue the writing. And actually, I finished writing my book, Den of Thieves, while I was the page one editor, which I said, I can never do that again. I don't, to this day, I don't know quite how I managed to do that. It was, the w burden of work was just intense, and I was only able to do it because it was all so interesting and exciting, but I knew I could never do that again. So um, that's when I decided to, to write full-time. Turning, turning full-time to writing, uh, that took you to the, print, the Clinton presidency and blood sport. Uh, fascinating character, if you look at him in all of his dimensions. How did you approach that project? Well, it all started because the Clintons came to me and asked if I would undertake an investigative book on Whitewater. The, the whole premise of this was that they were going to, I mean, the scandal was swirling around them, and nothing they had done seemed to have worked to put it to rest. So they thought, well, perhaps if we open up and tell an investigative reporter our story, and he then writes about it, people will assume, well, we do, we don't, we're not trying to hide anything, and, it, and that they would be exonerated in this. So that was, I mean, that was one of those moments. They actually sent someone, uh, Susan Thomasis, who later emerged in various hearings as a very close confidant of the Clintons. She came and broached this idea to me, and I remember as she walked out of the office, I just sort of felt, well, you know, my life has just turned upside down. I suddenly sensed that one way or another, and I ended up talking to them about it. I said, you know, don't, please don't unleash me on this. If you do have something to hide, it's, it's a terribly risky strategy and in fact I, I don't know that this is such a good PR strategy because I you know I'm not going to I can't tell you what I'm going to find what I'm going to write I can't give you any guarantees I'm not going to change my standards because you've initiated this but they said no no we want to do that and um, so off I went on the project and then I believe it was their lawyers who who de de deter them I mean I don't know for sure but to make a long story short they never ended up did co cooperate with me but by then it was too late I was 
you know, deeply embroiled. I'd committed to a book contract. I had to produce this book, and I ended up writing the whole book without any co further cooperation from them. What kind of what kind of personalities emerged? Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton. Well, the, I could talk for hours on that. I mean, I heard so much about the Clintons. Um, it was, but I will say, they're completely fascinating characters. In fact, people would say to me, "Well, weren't you angry with them?" And there were some unflattering things in the book about them. They said, well, did you just put that in because you were angry because they didn't cooperate you? And I said, why would I be angry? I said, this is the most interesting project I could possibly have been working on, only thanks to them. And they're such fascinating characters. I'm not the least bit angry to them. I'm grateful that you know, they did suggest that I do this. Um, it didn't turn out as I think they wanted, but uh, you know, that didn't bother me particularly. I was just trying to, trying to tell the truth. Um, they're fascinating characters. Uh, much of their public image, I think, is accurate. And then I think there's a, another side to them that um, is less attractive. I mean, all the good things you've heard about Bill Clinton, I think, are true. He's unbelievably charismatic. Uh, anecdotes about he could, he could meet a room of 60 people, and he would an hour or two later, he would remember every single one of their names in their hometowns. I mean, unbelievable. The stories of people who would meet him and say that he made them feel like they were the only person on the planet are just legion. He has this capacity to sort of beam in on people. At the same time, the less flattering part of it, I think, is he's extremely opportunistic. He's thoughtless. He's heedless. He hurts people. He uses people. He casts them aside. He lied on many occasions. Um, well, that, that's the tip of that iceberg. Were you surprised by what emerged in the uh, the intern scandal? Well, in the details, yes. Although I remember um, I had a memorable dinner in Washington with some some very good friends of mine, Joel Abramson, who's the the Washington bureau chief of the um, New York Times, Maureen Dowd, who's a columnist for the New York Times, and Connie Brock, who had had written a big article about Hillary. For the New Yorker and and me, so I was the only male there, and I was saying, you know, I've heard all these stories about Clinton in in Arkansas, but surely he's not womanizing in the White House. I mean, surely as president he would be able to curb these. And the three of them like rose up and they said, no, you can't control something like that. Take it from us. You know, we've known men like this. It won't have stopped. But. I was a little surprised that, yes, something like the intern scandal happened. But once it happened, all the pattern of behavior around it, the evasion, uh, the laws, the making other people ruin their reputations by lying to them and then having them repeat it, I'd seen it all before. Nothing at, from that point on surprised me. Another of your books takes place in Illinois, or has its origins in Illinois. In fact, in your hometown, the story of Michael Swango, the book is Blind Eye, he was a uh, physician who uh, gained a lot of notoriety in, in, in years to come. Um, what was his background? What uh, no one would have ever figured him for what appeared to be, we later found out to be a serial murderer. No, he had a um, you know exemplary background, or so it seemed. He was a he was a model student. He was charming. He was personable. Women were drawn to him. Uh, he could also be odd at times. I mean, I've heard a few stories like that. But on, on the whole, you know, he was the, the pride of his family and uh, had done extremely well in school. Um, I heard about the story, really, from a judge in Quincy who first called me to tell me that, that this guy had been convicted of poisoning co-workers at the Blessing Hospital there some years before, but that the judge would occasionally get phone calls from other hospitals asking for references, or did he know anything about this guy because he was now working in someone else's hospital? So from the beginning, the, the shocking thing was here was this this guy who'd been convicted, a doctor who'd been convicted of poisoning co-workers who was still getting hired, and that was the essential conundrum that sent me on this uh, journalistic quest. How did he keep getting hired, not only in the United States but of course later in Africa? Well, this took me the whole book to explore, and uh, it's not a very reassuring picture. Um, it seems very analogous to what I read now about the problems in the Catholic Church, these priests getting passed from one parish to another. I mean, horrifying, shocking behavior. I mean, doctors who strongly suspected him of being not just an incompetent doctor, but a murderer who was killing patients deliberately. And yet, Ohio State, for example, they wrote glowing recommendations, which he would then use to get jobs in the future. 
there was a pattern in the medical profession of, of simply trying to sweep uh, under the rug, whatever had happened there, and then get him out of their hospital and move him on somewhere else. In other words, just as long as he's not in their backyard, get him out of there. And that made it, and in addition to his own uh, notable charm and, and ability to, to persuade people. Although, it's such an amazing story. I mean, I, I couldn't, one reason I love nonfiction work is that I couldn't make this up. No one would believe it. But in, in several instances, he revealed in his interviews that he'd been co convicted of a felony in, in, in Quincy. Um, in one of those cases, he lied about what the felony was. Uh, but the other, he admitted that it was a poisoning case, although he said it was a miscarriage of justice. And he still got hired. One of these incidents was a panel of three psychiatrists who interviewed him and hired him to be a psychiatric resident. This was in, on Long Island in New York. It, it absolutely defies belief. Where is he now? Fortunately, I can report that since his book came out, he was indicted for murder. He pleaded guilty to three murders in New York and one in Ohio, and he was given consecutive life sentences with no eligibility of parole. Uh, he's at the Maximum Security Federal Penitentiary in Florence, Colorado, where um, I understand he's like on the same floor with the Unabomber, also someone of above average intelligence. So perhaps they can, you know, shoot the breeze from time to time. That would make for some fascinating eavesdropping, wouldn't it? Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> um, you're currently uh, uh, editor at large for Smart Money Magazine. You're also teaching journalism in uh, New York City. Uh, what what do you have to say about the the current state of the craft? Uh, we're we're seeing so many newspapers absorbed into so many companies, and the bottom line seems to be driving everything. And I suppose it always has to a certain degree, but there's there's really the focus on that these days. I also write um, for the New Yorker magazine, which is and I and I concentrate on lengthy articles and books, uh, narrative style, um, I hope with some literary quality work, which I'm the first to acknowledge is it's extremely time consuming, it's very labor intensive, which means it's very expensive uh, to produce. And yet, I, I think it's the most satisfying kind of journalism to do, at least for me. And I think it has tremendous impact. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of media. Uh, certainly with the internet, we're getting information instantly. I think it's a mistake for the print media in which I work to try to compete on the basis of speed. And if you can't compete on the basis of speed for news, where can you compete? I think the answer is in depth of information, um, soundness of analysis, uh, depth of reporting, finding out things that other people do not know, and then trying to bring literary craft to the telling of the story so that it makes an impact. And I, I think there will always be a market for that kind of story. People will be willing to pay for it. What kind of uh, advice do you give to young people who are looking at this as a career, as a profession? Well, my advice is, first of all, to, um, to, to write about what you care about and what you love and to try to love your work. I find if writing something is, is so burdensome to me that it's unpleasant, I'm dreading it, I don't want to do it, then it's just as bad for the reader. Um, if you're bored writing something, then the reader is going to be bored. And so why waste your time on all this? You know, don't do it so much out of duty, but out of desire, out of love, out of commitment. Um, and if you thoroughly enjoy doing it, then I think the readers enjoy it, or there's certain enough readers that will enjoy it that you can make a career out of it. And in the end, it kind of comes back to one of the very first things I was saying about my earliest work in journalism. It's a happy coincidence that if, as a writer, your work is is fun, thrilling, and satisfying to you, then it's also going to be that way to the readers. So you might as well enjoy yourself. What's the most rewarding thing about being a journalist? I think it's being able to satisfy your curiosity. Um, I think at root, that's what you do, is you, you pursue your own curiosity. And uh, again, this is not only a world of talkers, it's a world of know-it-alls. People are always going around parading what they know. But what's much more interesting in life, I find, is what we don't know. And we know so little. There are so many mysteries, new ones springing up every single day. Um, the arenas to you know, pursue your curiosity are endless. And that is, I find, is just, I have a you know, carte blanche to go anywhere, ask anything, and to share that information with, with everyone. 
what is, I don't mean I don't mean to ask you to tip your hand on what your next book or next project might be, but what what piques your interest? Well, I'm I'm happy to disclose that I'm I'm doing a book right now that grew out of September 11th, um, which I think is you know one of the historic events of my life, and it's a it's a thrill and a privilege to be doing a a, a book that touches on on that. It's about um, the, a man who was the head of security for Morgan Stanley, which had 3,700 employees in the World Trade Center at the time of the attack. Um, all but seven of them escaped, uh, thanks to his efforts, and uh, he went back to rescue a few remaining people and was killed when the towers collapsed. But his life is so interesting. Um, I guess, again, I say, what's, what's my curiosity about this story? I mean, from the very beginning, I wanted to know, well, one, why, why did he go back? Because he was out, along with all, virtually all the people. What, what would lead someone to go back into an inferno like that? That's baffling to me, just from the point of view of human nature. That's a question that his wife, who was left behind, I know, is, is struggling with. And then the more I found out about him, the more I realized that his life prior to that is at least as interesting as the way that it ended. It's an absolutely, again, it's a stranger than fiction, amazing story that I think in the end is very, really uplifting and hopeful so that out of this tragedy, I think, will come a story that will, um, I hope, inspire many people who read it. And I'm, you know, I'm in the middle of writing that right now. What was his name? Richard Rescorla. Were you in, were you in, in New York when this happened? Yes, I was, I live at, Sixth Avenue and 29th Street, and Sixth Avenue used to run into the World Trade Center at its south end. So every day I would, you know, come out on the corner and look down. There would be the World Trade Center, and I was there that day. And actually, I was, um, I, I nothing was on. I was practicing the piano that morning in my apartment, and I got a call, and it was my parents from Illinois. They had had the morning TV shows on, which I did not, and they said, "Do you have the TV on?" I said, "No." They said. We'll turn on the TV, and I did. And that the first tower was was in smoke. And then moments later, I saw on the television the second one hit. And then then I went outside. I, I could see from my windows everyone was out in the street. There was no traffic moving, and people were like looking horrified, covering their mouths. And I went down, and you could I'll never forget that sight: the the smoke and the flames billowing out of those towers. You had covered. Uh Rudy Giuliani, many years earlier, when yes. he was the uh, U.S. prosecutor in that area, and uh, had occasion to follow his career very, very closely. Uh, did you see any of the qualities when he was a when he was a prosecutor that carried him through in those days after the uh, towers came down? Yes, I, I had uh, written about Giuliani when he was a prosecutor, both for my, a book I did on prosecutors and and when he was in the Justice Department, and then he was a principal prosecutor in the. Wall Street scandals, and uh, he has, you know, limitless energy, um, incredible drive, uh, a somewhat theatrical flair, and um, natural instinct for the spotlight, which stood him, I think, in quite good stead at this moment when people needed someone to fill that vacuum, uh, and, and and a very good empathy. Uh, for the victims and a willingness uh, to be honest about what was happening. Um, I think uh, some of those same qualities, you know, I, I think he, you know, he overstepped a little bit when he said, well, perhaps I should have a third term as mayor or perhaps I should stay on. That too is vintage Giuliani, that maybe just letting his ego take him one step too far. But uh, by and large, the qualities that I think people you know, are so grateful for in, the, in that time of crisis. They were, they were all on display. He was a very effective uh, prosecutor as well, and he used the same qualities then. I'm at the end of my questions. Uh, one final thing I would like to ask, though. Uh, being honored in Illinois with uh, the state's highest honor for individual achievement, what are your reflections on that coming back here? Well, I, I was immensely gratified to, to learn about this. I think if you, in a way, you can go out into the world and you can be hailed here or there or have this kind of success or not, but what people think of you in your, in your hometown, in a way, is a little bit like, well, what do your parents think of you? I mean, there's something almost primal about that. Um, that and, and I appreciate the fact that the values of many people I know in Illinois and in Quincy in particular are so down to earth. They're, they're not impressed, you know, by the, you know, the glitz of Hollywood or 
um, you know, kind of the passing fame, that people who, you know, get on The Tonight Show or something like that. So to be recognized and honored by people like that, I think, means something very, very much to me uh, that nothing else would, would quite duplicate.